All right. Well, good morning, everybody. What you doing so far back there, Michael? Uh, okay. All right. Sitting with Charlie. Okay. This morning. You know, I did uh, some lessons on uh, purpose, meaning in our lives. One of the last, the last session I did was on crucifixion, purpose and suffering. Uh, brought some things together that there's meaning in suffering, and once suffering has meaning, it ceases to be suffering. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to talk about after that. Uh, is how can we accomplish, how can we face those things? Um, now last week, of course, uh, we kind of focused on uh, resurrection of Jesus because it was the holiday season here in America, Easter Sunday. So we kind of went there last week, but I want to kind of get back on something here to help us to consider the scripture teaches us that this life is going to be difficult down here. It's supposed to be. Don't be surprised that it is. It's supposed to be. And if something's supposed to be a certain way, I guess it's a lot easier to accept if you think, well, that's the way it is. Now, we have used verses here just recently, previously, and some of the lessons that I know that I've been given and mentioned it. We talked about crucifixion. We talked about suffering uh, and made it very clear. Not only was Jesus actually literally crucified uh, on a wooden cross, that's a fact, a biblical fact and a historical fact. He went through that process. But it was Jesus that said, yeah, but there's a cross for you as well. If you're going to follow me, he said, you'll need to deny yourself and take up your cross. He said, if you seek to save your life as you know it, you'll lose your life. But if you're willing to give up your life for my sake in the gospel, you'll save your life. Now, he said that to Jews at the time that probably couldn't figure out what is he talking about because the idea, they knew what a Roman cross was. They didn't know he was going to be on one. And certainly they couldn't see one voluntarily or voluntarily taking up the cross. We also saw in John 16 and verse 33 where Jesus said that in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. In the world you'll have it. Paul, the apostle Paul, would say that all who would live godly in Christ Jesus would suffer persecution. And if you would look at Hebrews chapter 12, this chapter starts out kind of looking back at the 11th chapter of all the faithful Old Testament saints who went through many, many, many trials. Now in Hebrews 12 and 1, therefore we also, we also are the Christians, we Christians also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, will let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnared us, snares us. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, 
Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord love, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. Verse 11 says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen those hands that are hanging down and those feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that which is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Take up a cross. You will have tribulation. You are going to need to have endurance. You have not resisted under bloodshed striving against sin. You're going to get scourged. It's going to be painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it will yield peaceable fruit. So lift up them hands that are hanging down. Those feeble knees that are giving out. Lest you be discouraged. What a picture. What a picture. And to top it all off when the Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7... Verse 13, that we really need to enter by a narrow gate because why does the gate broad as the way leads to destruction? There may be many who go in by it because narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way which leads to life and there be few who find it. So on top of all that, he says, for all you've been through, the cross and tribulation and struggling and discouraged, few will find it. <laughs> this is the gospel? <laughs> I thought gospel meant good news. Where's the good news in that? Easy. That's what it says, isn't it? Remember what they cried out in Matthew chapter 19 and in verse 25 there? This would be about the rich ruler who wanted to know what he had to do for eternal life. Jesus said, keep the commandments. And well, I've done that all my life. What do I lack? Well, you lack one thing. Sell what you have, give to the poor. Take up your cross, follow me. You have treasure in heaven. Guy went away sad because he had many possessions. So Jesus said in verse 23, I'm in Matthew 19, 23. Assuredly, I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. And they said, well then, well, then who can be saved? We got to go through all this? And then you say, few will find it? Well, then who can be saved? Jesus said, uh, looked at them and said, well, with men, with men, this would be impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things possible. Well, I guess that would be good news. That would be good news. With God, all things are possible. But with men, it would be impossible. Well, I guess we better find out then how to get on board with God. That we're not trusting in flesh or our efforts. We need to find out how's, how, how's this going to be done. You know, again, the Bible does tell us. We've talked about it before, but I'll just give you this. Real quick here, you know, in Job 14, Job says, yeah, life here is tough. Man who is born of woman, Job 14 and 1, is a few days and full of trouble. 
He, man, comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and he does not continue. And I believe maybe one more I'll give you in Ecclesiastes 2 and 23 here. Ecclesiastes 2 and 23. Speaking of man, verse 20, well, 22, for what has man for all his labor, for all the striving of his heart, which he has toiled under the sun? All his days are sorrowful. His work is burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. So I guess that's, that's it. It's tough. It's tough. Now, Matthew 11. This is my verse. You guys know this. Matthew 11. Jesus says, Come to me, all, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He's trying to contrast something here. Them, or us, and him. Well, last I checked, though, Jesus was human. You know, I'm looking at uh, Hebrews 2, verse 14 says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, made of flesh and blood, children, us, what well, says he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him, had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death, that's us, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 17 says, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's also able to aid those who are tempted. Chapter 4 and 15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, Yet without sin, chapter 5 and verse 8 also says, Though he were a son, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Yet he says, Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He was human. What, did he just have a nice neighborhood to live in? He didn't have no hassles. Everybody just liked him, got along great with everybody all the time. Never had a bad hair day. Never felt the heat of the sun. Never felt the weariness of the way. Now, we certainly know that near the end of his life, when he began his public ministry, a lot of people didn't like him. The authorities didn't, Roman or Jewish. Well, mostly Jewish. Later, Roman had problems. He was human, lived here. Well, how is it his yoke was so easy? How is it his burden so light? He's the, he thinks we're the ones having a hard time, obviously. He was saying, come to me. You guys are struggling. You guys got burdens you can't bear, he's saying. I'm, I'm, he's like, I'm looking right at you. You're pulling in a yoke. It's difficult. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. 
Well, how is it he managed to escape all the things that affect people in life down here, in the flesh, men on the earth? D did he? No. We act like it, talked like it. What made him think his way was so easy? What made him think his burden was so light that, that we ought to drop ours and, and go with him? You know, they did crucify him. They did reject him, you know. They called him all kinds of names. They didn't believe in him. Came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. You want to join up with that? He said, well, you come and learn from me. And you'll find rest for your soul. You know, and we're, you know, we're not talking about beyond the Azure Blue here. Like, well, yeah, I'm going to get to go to heaven someday. Remember, that's what Jesus was at Lazarus' tomb last week. I shared that in the scripture. Kind of fit because it was Resurrection Sunday. Talked about Lazarus. Remember Martha and Mary? They told him, well, if you'd have been here, a brother wouldn't have died. He said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, Lord, we know. In the resurrection at the last day, whenever that is, I am, he said, the resurrection and the life. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus in the next five minutes. And Martha's thinking, yeah, well, someday, I guess, down the road. Like, what am I going to do now? He's dead now. That's the way most people look at things. Yeah, well, that's all great. We get to go to heaven someday. But what about Monday, tomorrow, back in the old grind? You know, the Apostle Paul, and what is it, Romans 15 and 13, may the God of hope, he writes to the Christian, the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Tells me there's something for us now. We're here right now on the physical side of things, and we got to get through the rest of this stuff. And the scriptures already bore witness that life here in the flesh, as temporal as it is, is, is difficult. Even that picture of the hands hanging down and the feeble knees, the discouragement that so many feel. Is there not something for us now? He said, you learn from me, you will find rest for your souls now. Come to me, you that labor are heavy late. The burden is heavy. Think about it for just a second. A weight is constant. It's just a weight. Let's say it's 50 pounds. Say there's a big block here, a cement block, and it's 50 pounds. It's constant. It's the same if it's in Asia or Africa. It's 50 pounds. It doesn't matter. 50 pounds, it's constant. But the ability of any one of us to handle it is going to be directly proportionate to one's strength or weakness. The weight is 50 pounds. The example I want to give you is my grandson, Judd. He's 11. Not a real big kid. But he, you know, he likes to do stuff. And then there's Troy Peston. Now, you guys know Troy. Troy lifts a lot of weights. In fact, Troy does something, you know, that's, 
it's really challenging. I don't know if he still does. He's not here for me to ask him right now. He could have piped up. But uh, I don't know if it's a, it's a competition, I guess. You've maybe seen it on TV where people, guys, big guys, pick up heavy stuff like a big rock. Awkward. Real heavy weights, but awkward. Not like a barbell. Not like you get a, a very, you know, a barbell with exact weight on it and good handle grips, you know, knurled and with your nice leather gloves on and, you know, and, and you're going to go pick this thing up and, and handle it. They pick up a big rock or something or a washing machine. You ever seen that? Or pick up a log or something. These big brutes want to go pick up stuff. That is a real test of strength, man, because it's not easy to get a grip on that stuff. It's not easy to pick that stuff up. And they have competitions like that. So if a weight is a constant, we had 50 pounds, and you had Judd here, and if I told Judd, Judd, pick that thing up and go take it over here and set it down somewhere, you would watch him struggle with that, and Troy Paston would pick that thing up very easily and want to know where do you want it. You know, no problem at all. And yet the weight is a constant. But the difference is, it's directly proportionate to the ability that one has as far as their strength or weakness is going to determine the difficult. When Jesus said, come, my burden is light because he's stronger than we are. He lived here. He went through all that. Why would he think of his weight? Is burden light? Is yoke easy? Because he's stronger. A weight is a weight. It's what it is. But see, his ability that he had to deal with those things made all the difference in the world as to whether or not this was a challenge and what kind of impact that it had on his Outlook, his mindset, his disposition, his attitude. Because all those things that we go through affect our attitude. You know, it doesn't take long. If we're having a hard time with something, we're just not finding any way. Man, frustration starts to build. And next thing you know, sin's not far away. Sin's not far away. It won't be long, man. And you're going to be going nuts or something. Rip somebody's head off. Kick the cat. I don't know. Something's going to happen. You might regret it later, but you're going to feel the frustration and then regret, and then maybe fear. See, not perfected in love because perfect love casts out fear. See, there's still a problem. There's still a weakness here somewhere. He said, come to me. Learn from me. I'll show you how to handle that. Obviously, what Jesus is talking about, he ain't talking about when I use Judd and, and Troy as an example. I mean, that's a physical weight. That's not, Jesus wasn't talking about barbells or refrigerator contest, pickup contest. He's talking about life. He's talking about life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, and he was the Apostle Paul, I've talked about this before, he had an issue. He was going through so much. You can see what he was going through. If you looked at the 11th chapter about the beatings, you know, in verse 23, labors and beatings and prison and deaths often. He got the old uh, 40 stripes minus the one five times, three times, beaten with rods, said he was stoned and shipwrecked. He'd been in perils of the deep and in perils of waters and robbers and his own countrymen that were opposed to him. He was in perils of Gentiles, perils of the wilderness. He hunger, thirst, weariness, fastings. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet, he was going through stuff. 12 verse, chapter 12, verse 7, Enlist, I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. He said, a thorn was given to me, a thorn in the flesh. A messenger from Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I plead with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. 
And I, I, you know, I try to really put myself in what he's saying. This guy is an apostle. It's not like he's someone that's not even converted yet and has no idea what's going on. This guy is an apostle. He is born and has the spirit. Already laboring, obviously, if you see it from that, as I mentioned, the 11th chapter, suffering too. He comes to the conclusion, I mean, he did a careful analysis here, as I'd like to think any of us do as we're going through stuff. We, we're trying to understand it, try to put it together. His conclusion was, this got to go. This has got to go. So he went and pleaded. He pleaded with the Lord. He didn't just say, hey, Lord, how about? He said, I pleaded with him. I mean, it's like he's begging, man. Three times that it might depart from me. I've told you guys this before. You do what you want with it. He doesn't say specifically in that context what that thorn in the flesh is. But I'll tell you what, when you go back and read that 11th chapter of all that stuff, don't you think that stuff would affect your outlook on life? I've said it before. If I had been in one of my places overseas and we got caught doing something and I was taken and was beaten with rods, I would probably rethink going back there again. I'd probably say, well, that was enough of that. That's just one thing. Granted, I've had to deal with the heat and the mosquitoes and some of the other things. Being with Mike Cover in the bush that long. <laughs> I had to suffer with jet lag, and I don't see that listed here. So I do have one on the Apostle Paul. He never experienced jet lag. It affects your attitude when you don't feel good, you know what I'm saying? It is hard to keep a proper focus when you are inundated. In, you know, these bodies, these human fleshly bodies, man, these are sensory. They just take in all this stuff that bombards them, whether it's the heat or the freezing cold or hunger or a lot of other things that can make you fever. Let's say, you're, let's say you are flat out sick, and I've been there too, let me tell you. It's hard to maintain a proper focus when you are really sick and got to get on a plane full of smells like fish, you know, and you've been throwing up all night. And I'm on this plane they, uh, serving fish on the airplane, reeks of fish, and I'm holding my nose and breathing through my mouth and thinking I'm going to throw up on this airplane. I digress. It's a drag. He said, I need some relief here. And the response from heaven was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Remember, the ability of one to handle this weight is going to be directly proportioned to their strength or weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul gets that. He, he realizes the Lord just said something here. Most glad, well, therefore, most gladly then, I'll rather boast in my infirmity that what the power of Christ may rest on me. Jesus said, you come and learn of me. You'll find rest. I want the power of Christ resting on me. I'll take pleasure then in infirmity, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Strong. You see, you want to activate the power. You know, obviously, if we had magic wand, and we had Troy passed in here, and we had Judd, if we could sprinkle magic dust on Judd and make him Troy Peston size, then suddenly he'd be able to handle that weight very easily. If we could provide Judd with the strength. The weight is still the weight. It's 50 pounds. Or 
Or we could use another example. Judd ain't going to stay 11 years old, Lord willing, if he grows up to be a young guy and out there working hard and hopefully grows a little bit more. 50 pounds ain't going to seem like nothing to him later in life. He'll be able to handle it. Because what? Something changed. The weight didn't change. The weight is still the weight. It's still 50 pounds. A bag of water softener salt is still a bag of water softener salt. It's still 40 pounds. Or them 80 pound jobs. Who don't get me them anymore? <laughs> Thank you. Not that she put them in the car. She'd get them guys in the store to bring it out and throw it in the trunk. And I had to figure out how to get it out of the trunk. I should have called Troy Peston. <laughs> Don't you guys tell him all I did was bad mouth him all morning. <laughs> I think he likes me, though, so it maybe it won't be a problem. <clears throat> My strength is perfected in weakness. Jesus had strength. He could handle it. Romans 5 and 6 says that when, when we were without strength... Christ died for the ungodly. Yes, we're weak. We sing the song, I am weak, but you are strong. <clears throat> God didn't intend to leave us weak. When we were without strength, when we were unable to please God, when we were unable to live the lives, hopefully, that maybe even we wanted to live, just didn't know how, to do the right thing, but didn't have the strength. Christ died for us at that time so that we would not be weak anymore, but made new, born again, and this time strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man. It says in Acts chapter 9, we'll go through a couple of these real quick. Acts chapter 9, after Saul of Tarsus was immersed, after being blinded on the road to Damascus and the gospel being preached to him, he rose and was baptized. Acts 9 and 18. Now it says in verse 22, Saul increased more and more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus was the Christ. The Lord was now working in him, and he was getting stronger. Look at Acts 18. <clears throat> verse 22, and when he had landed, speaking of Saul, Paul, at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Verse 23, after he'd spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Pergia in order, in order, and strengthening all the disciples. What? Lifting weights? PT? How do you strengthen the disciples? What, what strength really matters? It's not our muscles, physical. Strengthen on the inward man. Greater the faith for the Christian, greater the power. Because the power comes from God. It's the Holy Spirit. If we have little faith, we have little power. If we have great faith, we have great power. When Jesus would say, if you had faith even as small as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it would obey you. Well, how's that happen? He's just trying to communicate to us that through our faith, the Spirit of God works. It's God that can move the mountains. And, of course, those mountains aren't the real estate, the physical rock mountains. It's these obstacles in our way, hindering our forward progress in our spiritual sojourn. Because of the weakness that we've all possessed in the flesh. He said, you come and learn from me. You'll find rest for your soul. 
He'll give us strength. Those weights won't be anything. The yoke will be easy. The burden light. Because Christ in us, the hope of glory, will provide exactly what we need. Ephesians chapter 3 couldn't be any plainer. In verse 16, Paul writes here that he, Jesus, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Tells you exactly. Granting us according to the riches of his glory that we could have strength. Strength. Where? Or by what? The spirit. Where? In the inner man. Christ dwelling may dwell in your hearts through faith. Our faith his power, his spirit. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Man, think about that. Think about that. Our ability and our little finite little pea brains to even comprehend God Again, I've said this before, and I had a couple of additions that Sue, her dad gives me, her father-in-law, the National Geographic. It talks about the cosmos. God spoke that into existence. I like how it says he made the sun and the moon and the earth and you know everything, and then it's just like uh, kind of, oh, by the way, uh, and he made the stars. He made the stars. They can't even comprehend our own galaxy, the Milky Way, let alone all the other bazillion galaxies. It just goes on and on and on. That's our God. Or you could flip it around. Forget the telescope. Look in the microscope. Look the other way. Look down. It's how small and how small and how small and intricate and all the data that they find in the DNA and all this code and all this stuff. We cannot even comprehend the God that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea and all that's in it and the cosmos and us who knows the beginning and the end of all things. And man... What is man that thou art mindful of him? That he knows us, he knows the hairs on our head. Every idle word we've spoken. This is the God that knows us and loves us, was willing to sacrifice his son for our sake. Now we can be filled with all the fullness of this God. That what? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Man! You think if you had all that somebody would notice? If we had all that contained in this mortal coil as Brother Jay likes to say? This clay jar that's been so weak in the past. Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. How vivid is your imagination? That even our vivid imagination can't even contain our potential. And not in dumb things. Now, I may better say that right now. Not in dumb, stupid things. <clears throat> not to run faster than a speeding bullet. Not to be able to jump over church buildings in a single bound. Not, you know, all the ridiculous. And not the miraculous. That, the real miraculous is being transformed and conformed to the image of the Son of God. Now, that is a miracle. To bring us that far from as far away as we've been in a weakness of our flesh, 
with our fears, our uncertainties and doubts, our bad attitudes, our evil thoughts, our lust, blasphemies, pettiness, conform us into the image of the Son of God. And it says that's his intended purpose for us. Romans 8, 29, those whom God foreknew, he predestined that they would be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn of many just like him. That is a miracle. You know, the Bible refers to those in Christ are a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A new creation. Look, you can't have a new creation unless there's an old creation. What's well, the old creation? Well, it's the physical creation. How long take God to make all this and the stars? Six days. It's going to take them a lot longer than six days to take the likes of most of us and conform us into the image of his son. Now that's work. He'll need to take more than a seventh day break <clears throat> when all this is accomplished. He'll have to take a couple years off. I think you get what I'm trying to say. And by the way, I'm just using Bible terminology here. These are concepts that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, if he has strengthened you with his spirit in your inner man, then something has got to give. Unless we're so stubborn, stiff-necked, refusing. Because that's one thing that God, believe it or not, God, Jesus said all things are possible with God except one thing. He will not take away your free will or your choice. Nope. Nope. Jesus wouldn't do it. You know, God could raise up stones to be sons of Abraham, but he don't want to. God could make robots. I saw a robot on TV the other day, what the Japanese are doing. I mean, that thing really looked lifelike. It could talk, too. You know, like you normally see in sci-fi movies, you know, when they're really humans, they just say they're robots because they're actors, right? But this one really was getting there. I'm thinking, look at that. I'll bet God could make a real cool robot. But he ain't going to because he don't want robots. <clears throat> Angels ain't robots. They're free will, and some of them really blew it, like a third of them. We're not robots either, and we are never going to have our choices taken away from us. <laughs> Philippians 4.13, I'm giving you, I said I was going to give you these fast. I guess it wasn't too fast. Maybe one more. Uh, Philippians 4, you know this one. I can do, Paul said, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember what he said? Jesus said, all things are possible with God. Well, here you got another one. This time he's, a, he's a, applying it directly to Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who gives me bigger muscles? Nope. He's going to strengthen me in my inner man through my faith, his power, that I might be able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could have even imagined according to the power working in me. And not dumb things, real things. Believe it or not, to turn the cheek, to give up the cloak. Well, maybe look right here. I don't know about you, but I'm right there in uh, Colossians 1. It should be right across on your page because it's another one of those. Verse 9 says in Colossians 1 and 9, For this reason also since the day we heard of it, speaking to the Christians here, we do not cease to pray for you, Paul says, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that's actually what I'm talking about this morning. I'm not talking about physical things, and you know that. I'm talking about we have a need to have the spiritual understanding. If the yoke is going to be easy, if the burden is going to be light, it's going to be because we've been strengthened to handle it. A strength that comes from God. That verse 10 says that you may walk worthy. Notice that. 
In order for us to walk worthy, we need to have knowledge of his will and we have to have spiritual understanding. In order for him to produce that, that Christ-like character in us, that's what he's talking about. This is where the yoke becomes easy. This is where the burden becomes light. That we may walk fully, walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here it comes. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power that we may be able to pick up 500 pounds. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Doesn't that seem kind of anticlimactic? Man, when we're talking about having all this strength with all might, and you know, it's like we're ready to go out and, I don't know, knock something over. He says you got to have all that for patience and long suffering so you have a good attitude. You see, because in the world you're going to have tribulation. But he says, be of good cheer. This is see what he's trying to say. Be of good cheer. If we have all, wis- all knowledge of his will and we have wisdom and understanding, we're going to know where, how to put the square pegs in the square holes and how to put the round pegs in the round holes. We're going to know how to take a step back and look at this life and go, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. It takes spiritual power to face this life with a great attitude and with confidence. That's why Jesus was saying, you come and learn to me. He was human. He lived here too, but he had a great attitude. I mean, he got mad. And the Bible says you can get mad. It says you can be angry, but don't sin. That's what it says. Now, he looked on them with anger, these, these religious people, because of the hardness of their heart. Because he was going to heal a man with a withered limb. And they were just looking to find fault to see if he was going to heal on the Sabbath day. It says that Jesus looked at them with anger. I mean, God gets angry, don't he? Ever read the Bible? Ain't no sin in that. As long as it's a righteous indignation. But you've got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away, and when to run. You've got to know how to rightly divide these situations. And you can if you're filled with the knowledge of his will and you have all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You'll then be fruitful in every good work. You'll be increasing in the knowledge of God. You will be strengthened with might in your inner man according to his glorious power for all patience, long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Ta-da! There's a lot of stuff in here, good stuff. Through our faith, we can move mountains. But we must first, as he said, you come. And learn from me. Thanks for your attention this morning.